Jack White, or Jack Two Albums, as we know him now. He's got two records coming out next year. Jack White, that's on the first of them. It's called Taking Me Back. And welcome to Studio E, which, as regular listeners will know, is the upstairs room at the ship in London Town, round the corner from our proper studio, where we're not allowed guests. So we've decamped to meet these two fellas with us, Soul Savers, Dave Garn and Rich Machin. Well, what do you think of Jack White? Uh, just very quickly, sorry to just land that on you. Have you got any Jack White records, either of you? I love Jack White. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a fan. I mean, he's one of those few kind of musicians around at the moment where, like, he's got that kind of signature tone to his guitar playing. So if I hear him playing as a guest on somebody else's record, even when I'm waiting for the radio to tell me what it is, you've got that thing of, like, that's Jack White. Like, and there are so few people now who just have that thing. Um, and I love feel about music yeah. and tone and all of that stuff. And, He's one of the few kind of people still around at the moment. It's strange in a way. I've only, it's only just occurred to me, but actually some of the influences which he's mined aren't that dissimilar to some of the things that you've touched on in parts of this new Soul Savers album, is it? I'd say it's probably very similar, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even the, the way we approached making the record, Rich and I, you know, talked about this for a while, actually, for a couple of records we've you know, been getting to this place where we wanted to be able to be in a studio with, uh, you know, a group of musicians that, you know, Soul Savers um, at the same time. Yeah. So that we were all actually really playing off each other. And that's what we, we managed to achieve with this record, you know, a couple of years ago when we finished it. Um, but we were all in the same room together. We tracked a song a day. We, we we did a lot of sort of pre. We knew what we were going in to do. Really, we you know we didn't go in there like blind. Um, but we we it was one of those things where you, each day you're kind of tripping over yourself like, well, when's something going to go wrong? You know, like, <laughs> um, and you know it really didn't. You know, every every day I'd sort of drive up the coast. We did it out in Malibu in California and um, Rick Rubin's place, Shangri La. So I was staying at this little hotel down in, in Malibu on the beach, and I'd get in my car and drive up the coast about 30 minutes to the studio and just be kind of looking out the window like going. What is what's what's going on here? You know? I mean, it, uh, I've got to say, it does, it does sound quite idyllic. I want to come back to the. Record, I want to come back to the record in a second. Here's a weird question: When did you find out that you could sing? <laughs> well, I would say I was very young, and you know, so yeah, doing all that same old stuff that um, you know all of, all our singers probably did, mimicking someone else in the bedroom, Bowie. T-Rex, whatever, Gary Glitter, Slade. They were, those were the kind of sort of 45s, but like, and Bowie became like the album person, but then punk rock came along. So it, for me, it was all about the damned when that happened. And uh, But yeah, I, you know, I found that actually mimicking, you know, I used to entertain my family a bit as well when Top of the Pops came on and someone was on there like Mick Jagger or something. I could I could mimic immediately. I found that I was good at doing that, at nicking other people's ideas. Um, but it was years and years and years in that practice that I, I would say I found my own way of doing that. Probably at least 10 years in of making records with my band even. Yeah, really. I mean, the, one of the reasons I ask, and I don't know if you agree with this, Rich, but there's, it's the different uses of Dave's voice on this album that's one of the most noticeable things, because there's lots of different versions, almost, I think, of the voice. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, very much. Um, but to me, like when you're making a record, a particularly like, you know, a vocal record like this, that's about what you're doing. You're putting the, vo the voice front and centre. Yeah. And you're there to support and hold that. Yeah. And but it's, it's amazing. about showing the different kind of colours that you yeah. can do. It's amazing. Because I, I started trying to give them all names. So there's, there's Lullaby Dave. There's <laughs> Demon Elvis Dave. <laughs> yeah. Low-key Crooner Dave. There's a lot of Daves on this record, well, is what I'm saying. There's definitely the, the, the Sybil, uh, you know, the movie Sybil, yeah, the film Sybil. Uh, there's a lot of personalities in there. Um, you know, and, and calling the record imposter was sort of ironic as well, in a way, because uh, all those different kind of... Uh, 
moment, uh, if you like, within like the use of my voice and songs, you know, in this particular amazing choice of songs that we uh, we ended up uh, sitting with, it enabled me to uh, you know explore all those different parts of my personality, if you like, music and and songs and and they've, they've always since I was a, a little kid. It's always been somewhere where I can vicariously live through someone else, and I think with this record, like Rich said, you know, and I, you know, thanks to Rich and all the band, of course, but giving me this platform to, like he's like Rich said, uh, to really go there with mm. my voice, I, I felt that that was this was a, an amazing opportunity. So, where uh, who had the idea then? Because this is um, for people who don't know. So, it's an album of cover versions. There's twelve on the record. We'll get to the selection process in a second. But who thought? Well, this time round, let's ex- let's explore oh, other people's cool. music. Who who first came yeah, up we with just that? Were chatting, yeah, it was just it was just a conversation, really. Yeah. Um, we were on the phone one afternoon, you know. Um, speak regularly and we were talking about different things and I think Dave just said we should do a covers record how do you feel about it right um, and then so talk us through the process of choosing the tracks because I mean you've got obviously that wasn't everything so easy, to choose from <laughs> there's so many I mean in the beginning I, I think we sort of both were like well let's start you know we knew we were making Richard and I often like we you know we don't we don't necessarily have to talk about a lot of things because you know it sort of comes easy uh, the choice of you know the things that we might be influenced by or that we've been listening to or that we have listened to in the past or R- ritual introduced me to new things and you know probably that works vice versa as well and sometimes we just fall in the same place but but the, was there any real criteria did you start off thinking well i know I've got a, in my head. I've got an idea of where we can take this song if we take it apart and put it back together again. Was there? Were you thinking about it technically, or was it just I love this song? Let's just have a crack at this. Well, you, you start with just stuff that you love. Like that's the thing. It's like you first of all, you've got the perfect excuse to live in your record collection again for the next three months. Like kind of <laughs> digging through, like all of these things. So you know your yeah, initial was- long list of stuff that you're backwards and forwards with, and then <clears throat> you break it down to okay, I, I think we could actually do something really cool with this one as well. Yeah. Like, you know, it, it's, you've got to be doing something that is respectful, you know, to the original at the same time, um, but bringing your own dynamic to it. Yeah. I was really, con- I mean, i got to say early on as well, once we, once I started to go into my own little studio in New York and, and um, when, when we'd pick, say, I don't know, maybe 20 songs, mm. um, started to sort of make a playlist of those and uh you know just kind of get into them get into the song really get into what it is how it feels what can i do with this and um what does it make me feel like you know and i, I started to feel quite early on that all of them took on this very sort of like we you know were saying earlier a uh, sort of cinematic you know uh, feel about it like it had a feel already very early on if i sort of laid out the songs in certain ways that it was taking me on definitely on a journey of like an, an a, a a conventional album with two sides you know that you'd have to get up and turn it over and and get the other side going on and i started to think about that a lot um early on how would that be then i started to think about well if you were performing in front of people how would this fall how would you put a set together of these whatever ends up being 12 songs uh, that people would be taking on a little little journey. Yeah. And so that to, to me is like, once I've got that place in my head, um, and I do it with other records too, and it doesn't necessarily, I, not necessarily everybody's on the same page with that, but with this, I think Rich and I, once we got in the studio, we kind of, it, it was gravy. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, you know it, it really was. I'm, I'm, I'm aware that not everyone's heard this record, so we'll take, we'll break here just to play you a track from it. This is a cover of a PJ Harvey song. I love Polly Harvey. Um, this is from as we all do. Well, this is from, yeah. but this is weirdly, it feels like the lost PJ Harvey album. This, it's the one that doesn't really get talked about as much as some of the well, others. Rich brought think. this song forward. I mean, I was totally aware of the song, but. Yeah, yeah it, it's a great record. It's the same thing. It's one of those ones that 
yeah, it's passed over by a lot of people, but I, it's possibly my favorite song of hers as well. And I could totally just all of a sudden see how it would fit within what we were doing. The, the simplicity of the original is just unbelievably beautiful. And here's the Soul Savers version of it, the desperate kingdom of love. Kingdom of love. It's Soul Savers, it's from the new album Imposter, a selection of 12 cover versions. That's uh, their take on PJ Harvey's Desperate Kingdom of Love. Uh, Dave and Rich are with us upstairs in the ship. So in the story then, so we've got the 12 songs. At what point do you think, because there must be a point where you think, you know, some people are going to compare this to Johnny Cash. And then you go to the same studio where Johnny Cash made, what was it, American 4, I think he made, at Rick, Rick Rubin's studio, yeah, yeah. just to compound that comparison. Um, I mean, you were asking for it. Oh, uh, completely. We say it up like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, there's been some comparisons in that way, um, of course, and I think we were fully aware that that would happen. Um, but it's not a know, bad comparison it's not a bad comparison at all and if you use that as a template as an idea of how to approach uh, a record like this um, to make it a complete collection of songs with a voice that has a consistency uh, let's say um, if not some very different personalities as you pointed out um, but but it's all there and it, and it, it feels like it will you know it feels like that it could be something new I think that that was important to us as well that it, we weren't trying to just this wasn't just a collection of covers uh, that it was a record that would stand the test of time you know um, that you could have played 20 years ago and you could play 20 years from now was there anything when as you were because obviously you must have analyzed these songs and you've got inside the songs which are written by other people did you, do you think either of you learned anything about songwriting from it or took something from it that you thought actually i i could try writing something a bit not like this i'm not going to copy it but the way it's been written and some of the facets of this song i find it really interesting and inspiring yeah i mean i think that's natural yeah you know i i, I find that just from listening to any music really as well i mean this you, we got into it much deeper but you spend a long period of time living within other people's work and it's natural that you want to kind of draw from that it's, it's such an incredibly talented bunch of you know other people it's it's hard for some of that to you know not rub off yeah it's there's something about as well even though this is a completely different collection of writers from different eras and uh, there's something about these songs that to me um, became really coherent together and I felt a real like kinship with these writers and these singers where you get this thing like we were talking about with the song with, with des uh, uh, the desperate kingdom of love you're able to kind of somehow be lucky enough to catch a moment and then live vicariously through it you know i uh, there's nothing i like better than that um and for me it's like the perfect once they always sort of started to sit together i was like Oh, they're not they're not so different no yeah i think that's <laughs> yeah. really interesting because yeah. i wrote down um one of the things i, I wanted to mention was whether subconsciously there was there were themes running through it and I, I and i couldn't find any but there is there is a kind of link and there is a you know that gospel freedom about i don't, a, I don't a know lot what that the, is but yeah. i'll tell you something when i hear the record now and when i sing through it it's a real freedom in there and a uh, this there is this sort of weird spiritual uh, element to it that um, I just be, feel so lucky you're... to be part of. I hope other people pick up on that, you know, as well. And that's the beautiful thing about song. And you know, if you carry it right, I'm just you know, you're just a vehicle for this stuff. The song is there. You know, and, and if I use my voice, and this is, as you pointed out, something that I'm trying to be learned, still learning how to do, but like, um, if I use it right, you know, I, I, I feel in touch with something. 
I don't yeah. know what that is, but so uh, uh, are we going to take this into. Would this inspire uh, aspire another Soul Savers record? And how also are you going to take? Uh, do we find that the next Depeche Mode record will have a large gospel element? Oh, I hope so. But <laughs> <laughs> I can just uh, imagine. Always that my favourites with you, Martin. I, you never, you know, I never know what Martin's going to be writing or doing and stuff like that. It's ne- that's never changed over the years. One thing always leads to another. This is something I've learned. And you have to take these opportunities, if they're there for you, to uh, uh, jump into um, and find out where you're going. Mm. I don't know where that destination is. Um, And I'm not closed-minded enough to think that that, like, I am going to still be surprised by something. Mm. Am I ready to jump into something like that right now? No, Mm. I'm not. Um, I'm I'm right here right now, and I want to really enjoy this. Uh, the work that Rich and I have done together over the last 10 years, we've done a few records together now, you know, I'm really proud of, as I know Rich is, I just don't know what's coming next, yeah. but like, I don't, I kind of don't care. I'm just, I'm just very gentle. I think I've earned that. Yeah, I think you've, you've earned a break. I'm just letting the Depeche Mode fans down lightly, saying, don't hold your breath. Yeah, not, yeah, not, not right yeah. now, but like, and I hope you understand that. You know, I, I read things that people show me and stuff when people get upset that, oh, well, you know, why don't you just make another Depeche Mode record? Well, what I've learned over the last 20 years making my own solo records and, and, and Soul Savers records and, um, is that uh, when I go back to do something with Depeche, and I don't know if this is the same for Fletch and Martin, but for me, it, it just makes me a lot more enthusiastic about what we may, maybe we can do together. Yeah. Um, and I, I, you know, Martin, I think, feels the same way as me about if we don't have a record that we can make together that's exploring something um, new for us, uh, we don't see the point. No, I think that's a very good... Yeah. Attitude no diss to the fans and yeah. or everybody that's carried us through this stuff and we're very grateful but you know it's got to be it's got to be great not just good that's yeah. how it's got to feel you know like um, gents we're out of time thank yeah. you so much um, for chatting to us uh, we'll play another track from the record I think we should play that Neil Young cover what do you think what do you reckon good with I'm me good with, good with me excellent Soul Savers on Six Music <laughs> 